on World News Tonight. Protesters detained. Big pro-democracy rallies held to condemn rioters storming the Congress, out of which 1,500 were detained. And tables turned. Investigations are underway as classified documents found at Biden's private office. Recovery on track. Planet Earth is on a hopeful path of healing with the ozone layer's improvement at the helm of the change. And it's a pink wave. Blackpink is back for the blinks in Asia with an extension of their Born Pink tour. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening to all our viewers and thank you for joining us tonight. Now, lined up tonight is an array of news bulletins and we are starting off with the updates on the capital riot in Brazil. Tens of thousands of people in Brazil have held pro-democracy rallies in an angry response to the storming of Congress by ex-President Jair Bolsonaro's supporters and Brazilian soldiers backed by police dismantled a camp of supporters of far-right former president a day after the first attack on state institutions since the country's return to democracy. Brazilian police on Monday cleared an encampment set up by supporters of ousted right-wing former president Jair Bolsonaro a day after thousands of rioters ransacked the presidential palace, the Congress, and the Supreme Court. The assaults marked the worst attack on the nation's governing institutions since Brazil's return to democracy in the 1980s. President Lula da Silva promised to bring those responsible to justice. Demonstrators shattered windows, demolished computers, and graffitied walls before police in riot gear retook the palace. On Monday, soldiers outside raised the flag, while inside, Lula held a cabinet meeting with his defense minister and commanders of the armed forces. Justice Minister Flavio Dino said 200 demonstrators had been arrested, although that number is expected to rise. U.S. President Joe Biden joined other world leaders in condemning Sunday's riots, calling them, quote, outrageous. Sunday's attacks recalled for many the assault on the U.S. Capitol two years ago by backers of former President Donald Trump. Dan Restrepo is with the Center for American Progress. Unfortunately, it's a story that's quite familiar, certainly to Americans. Um, you have a quasi-authoritarian right-wing former president who doesn't accept an election result, in this case, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, who actually fled Brazil a couple of days before the, inaugura the inauguration on January 1st of President Lula da Silva. Uh, and today, his supporters tried a coup. They they physically took over uh, the Congress, the Supreme Court, and the Brazilian equivalent of the White House. Lula blamed Bolsonaro for inflaming his supporters after a campaign of baseless allegations about election fraud after the end of his rule marked by divisive nationalist populism. Bolsonaro denied inciting his supporters and said the rioters had, quote, crossed the line. He left Brazil shortly after he lost the election and has been living in Florida. A Brazilian newspaper on Monday reported the former president was hospitalized in the U.S. with abdominal pain. A source close to his family said Bolsonaro's condition was, quote, not worrying. At least one Democratic lawmaker is calling for the U.S. to expel the right-wing former president. Representative Joaquin Castro of Texas on Sunday told CNN, quote, The United States should not be a refuge for this authoritarian who has inspired domestic terrorism in Brazil. He should be sent back to Brazil. The White House on Monday said it had received no requests from the Brazilian government regarding Bolsonaro's status in the U.S. There was a ray of hope on Pakistan as donors at an international conference in Geneva have pledged to give more than $9 billion to help it rebuild the devastated country following last year's devastating floods. As Pakistan struggles to cope with the impact of last summer's devastating floods, international donors have pledged billions in aid at a UN conference in Geneva. The catastrophe, which experts link to climate change, killed more than 1,700 people and displaced some 8 million others. Excellencies, we must match the heroic response of the people of Pakistan with our own efforts and massive investments to strengthen their com communities for the future. Rebuilding Pakistan in a resilient way will run in excess of 16 billion US dollars and far more will be needed in the longer term. Pakistan hopes that about half of the required amount will come from the international community. French President Emmanuel Macron said his country was ready to play its part. 
In Pakistan, we have therefore decided to mobilize a total of 360 million euros for projects which will be launched to address the challenge of resilient reconstruction and climate adaptation. The conference is being seen to test the willingness of wealthier countries to help poorer nations deal with the impact of climate-related disasters, a commitment that was agreed upon at the recent COP27 summit in Egypt. In the United States now, we have a developing news on a discovery on what appears to be records from the Obama-Biden administration at an office used by President Biden before he became president, and some of them classified. The White House legal team stated that classified documents from Joe Biden's vice presidential days were discovered in November by the U.S. president's personal attorneys at a Washington think tank. Nearly 10 documents were found at Biden's office at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland had asked the U.S. attorney in Chicago to review the classified documents which were handed over to the National Archives. Biden's lawyers say they found the government materials in November while closing out a Washington, D.C.-based office, the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement, that Biden used as part of his relationship with the University of Pennsylvania, where he was an honorary professor from 2017 to 2019. Fewer than a dozen classified documents were found at Biden's office. It is unclear what the documents pertain to or why they were taken to Biden's private office. Federal office holders are required by law to relinquish official documents and classified records when their government service ends. It was also said the documents were not the subject of any previous request or inquiry by the National Archives. The documents were discovered when Biden's personal attorneys, quote, were packing files housed in a locked closet to prepare to vacate office space at the Penn Biden Center in Washington, D.C., unquote. The White House was cooperating with the Justice Department and the National Archives. Still in the U.S., the Republican-led U.S. House of Representatives adopted a package of internal rules that gives right-wing hardlines more leverage over the chamber's newly elected Republican Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. The U.S. House of Representatives on Monday passed a rules package with key concessions to a faction of right-wing hardliners, whose holding out against Republican Kevin McCarthy triggered a dramatic and lengthy fight for him to become Speaker. Monday's final tally was a near-party line vote, 220 to 213, to approve the package. Only Republican lawmaker Tony Gonzalez joined all 212 Democrats in opposing the package, while another Republican did not vote. One of the key rules McCarthy had agreed to to become Speaker was one that allows a single lawmaker to call for his removal at any time. Texas Representative Chip Roy was among the Republican rebels, but flipped to help negotiate the agreement. He praised the new one-member threshold to vacate the Speaker's chair. I could walk down right there into the well and file a motion to vacate single person right now. Because that's the precedent. That's what we're operating under. Because that goes back to Jefferson. The whole point here is trying to ensure that we're continuing the great history of the people's house. Other changes included new restrictions on federal spending, potentially limiting McCarthy's ability to negotiate government funding packages with President Joe Biden, a cap on government spending at 2022 levels, and the creation of a committee to probe the Justice Department. Democrats denounced the legislation as a rules package for MAGA extremists. The full extent of concessions from McCarthy has not been made public, leading to representatives such as Jim McGovern questioning if lawmakers would ever find out what McCarthy had privately promised far-right Republicans. Republicans won fewer seats than expected in November's midterm elections, which amplified the hardliners' power and worsened divisions within the GOP. Lawmakers now face critical tasks in the year ahead, including addressing the federal government's $31.4 trillion debt limit. Failure to do that, or even a gridlock in Congress, would shake the global economy. We have some good news for you. Now, according to a UN report, our ozone layer is on a tangible path to healing, provided that the current policies are in place. The Earth's ozone layer is on track for recovery. That's according to a report published by the United Nations Environment Programme on Monday. A UN-backed scientific panel confirmed that the phase-out of nearly 99% of banned ozone-depleting substances has succeeded in safeguarding the ozone layer, leading to a notable recovery of the ozone layer in the upper stratosphere and decreased human exposure to harmful ultraviolet rays from the sun. 
The ozone layer is a thin part of the planet's atmosphere that absorbs most of the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. UV radiation can reach the Earth's surface if the layer is depleted, resulting in DNA damage, sunburn, and an increased risk of skin cancer. The report predicts that by 2040, the ozone layer above most parts of the world will have recovered to 1980 levels before the ozone hole was discovered by scientists in 1985. The Arctic will take around five more years to recover, while the Antarctic will see its ozone replenished in 26 years. That is, if protective efforts stay in place. One is the Montreal Protocol signed in 1987. The global agreement ratified by 198 parties regulates the consumption and production of ozone-depleting chemicals. This road to recovery also sets a good precedent for combating climate change. The Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization says, quote, Our success in phasing out ozone-eating chemicals shows us what can and must be done as a matter of urgency to transition away from fossil fuels, reduce greenhouse gases, and so limit temperature increase. But there are still risks ahead. One is geoengineering, a large-scale intervention in the planet's natural systems to counteract climate change. The panel also examined new technologies such as geoengineering for the first time and warned that the, of the unintended impacts on the ozone layer caused by methods like stratospheric aerosol injection. Stratospheric aerosol injection is putting aerosols into the stratosphere aiming to reduce climate warming by creating a cooling effect. But the report warns that this could in reverse affect ozone production, destruction rates and movement. We're going into a short commercial break. More news on the other side. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, with their six-part Netflix documentary series, a succession of high-profile TV interviews and a tell-all memoir, all featuring intimate relevations and accusations of discord, Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have shone not just daylight, but a blinding floodlight on the private affairs of the royal family. But when the dust settles, how will the general public will the monarchy? Prince Harry's recent scathing remarks about his family have shone a blinding floodlight on the private affairs of the British royals. But once the dust has settled, Harry's father, King Charles, and the other bruised Windsors will wonder if any of their royal magic has been permanently extinguished. To see this institutional gaslighting. Harry's six-part Netflix documentary series, a succession of high-profile TV interviews, and his tell-all memoir, Spare, all feature intimate revelations and accusations of discord. At the heart of Harry and Meghan's narrative is that Britain's sensationalist popular press is a devil and that members of the royal family have colluded with it to protect or enhance their own reputations. They argue that those who have not engaged with the press, like they say, themselves, have been subjected to cruel and untrue stories that have threatened their mental health and safety. Harry has made specific accusations against his stepmother Camilla, Charles' second wife and the Queen Consort, and his elder brother William, heir to the throne. So far, both have declined to respond. On the streets of London, Prince Harry's comments have had a mixed reception. I thought it was completely unnecessary. I hope he puts it all behind him and moves forwards, but who knows with it. It wasn't for me personally. Um, he's, rubbing, he's washing his dirty laundry in public too much. Don't need it. I think, it's, I think it's a bit wrong, but I hope they're all all right. <laughs> There's been a lot of public interest in the melodrama, though, as there was in the 1990s following the breakdown of Charles' marriage to his first wife, Princess Diana, Harry and William's mother. Their separation also played out in lurid colour in the pages of British tabloids. Buckingham Palace will likely take solace in the fact that the overwhelming majority of papers have sided with the royal family. An unsurprising outcome, given Harry and Meghan's views on the tabloids and the fact that they've sued a number of publications. Back in the 19th century, acclaimed constitutional writer Walter Bagot said that the British monarchy needed reverence and mystery, writing that we must not let in daylight upon magic. Right now, though, it's too soon to tell whether this latest scandal will cause the monarchy's sparkle to fade. 
South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin held phone talks with China's new top diplomat Shin Gang to offer congratulations on his recent inauguration. The two sides reaffirmed their commitment to boost Seoul-Beijing ties. According to Seoul's foreign ministry on Monday, South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin held phone talks with his new Chinese counterpart Chen Gang, where Park offered congratulations on his recent inauguration. During their first phone talks, the two sides reaffirmed their country's commitment to boosting bilateral relations and discussed pending issues on the Korean Peninsula, including North Korea's escalating provocations and ensuring stable supply chains. According to the Chinese Foreign Ministry, Chen said South Korea and China are close neighbors that will always live next to each other and partners that cannot be separated, adding that the sound and steady development of the two countries' relations serves as a common interest. He also noted that he would like to forge and maintain a good working relationship with Bach and jointly implement any important consensus reached by the leaders of the two countries. However, the new Chinese foreign minister also expressed concerns about the recent temporary restrictions imposed by South Korea on arrivals from China and voiced his hope that South Korea would uphold an objective and scientific attitude. Chen was appointed in late December to replace Wang Yi and previously served as ambassador to the United States. Marking his inauguration, Park last week in a congratulatory letter expressed his willingness to cooperate with Chen in maintaining high-level communications. Over to the war in Ukraine, President Vladimir Zelensky said that Ukrainian forces were withstanding new and even tougher assaults on Solidar near the eastern city of Bakhmut that Moscow has been trying to capture for months. This is what's left of a marketplace in East Ukraine after it was destroyed by a Russian missile strike. A large crater in the middle of the Kharkiv village as rescue workers sift through piles and piles of rubble. The past few weeks were a bit quieter, says this local. She didn't expect something like this to happen again. Two women were killed and others were wounded, including a 10-year-old girl, according to officials. It comes as Ukraine says it's repelling constant attacks in the eastern Donbass region by Russian mercenaries. In the frontline town of Seversk, servicemen are using the freezing temperatures and snowfall to help track Russian movements. The current weather conditions mean the enemy won't conduct any offensive actions. They try to hide their movements in the very front lines. So we are conducting constant air reconnaissance to fire on them with our artillery. In his nightly video address on Sunday, President Volodymyr Zelensky denounced why he called Russia's failure to observe a ceasefire it had declared for Russian Orthodox Christmas. Ukraine never agreed to the ceasefire, calling it a Russian excuse to reinforce troops. Both sides accuse the other of continuing hostilities throughout the period. As Moscow's invasion of Ukraine grinds towards the one-year mark, Russia's military is under pressure at home to deliver battlefield successes. On Sunday, it said a missile strike on Kramatorsk had killed 600 Ukrainian soldiers, found no visible signs of casualties at the scene of the attack, billed by Moscow as revenge for a New Year's attack that killed scores of Russian soldiers. A first attempt to launch satellites from Western Europe failed in the early hours of today, when Virgin Orbit said that an anomaly had prevented its rocket from reaching orbit after its history launched from a British coastal town. Britain's attempt to become Europe's first nation to launch satellites into space ended in bitter disappointment early on Tuesday. Virgin Orbit said an anomaly stopped its rocket from reaching orbit. A crowd had gathered in the coastal town of Newquay in southwest England to cheer on the historic mission. In the so-called horizontal launch, a modified Boeing 747 named Cosmic Girl carried Virgin's Launcher 1 rocket under its wing before releasing it over the Atlantic Ocean. Virgin Orbit, part owned by British billionaire Richard Branson, also livestreamed the mission. But then the company's Director of Systems Engineering and Verification, Christopher Relf, delivered the bad news. It appears that Launcher 1 has suffered an anomaly which will prevent us from making orbit for this mission. Uh, we are looking at the information and data that we have uh, gotten. 
The company later said the Cosmic Girl carrier and its crew had safely returned to New Key Spaceport, but gave no further detail on the status of the rocket and its payload of nine satellites. The UK Space Agency's Commercial Space Director Matt Archer said a first-stage burn had taken the rocket into space, but the second-stage engine had a, quote, technical anomaly and didn't reach the required orbit. Archer said the British government, Virgin Orbit and other parties involved will investigate the failure of the mission, which was the company's first outside its US base. He called it disappointing, but added, quote, we will continue to press on and we will get there in the end. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The usual hustle and bustle returned to the manufacturing factory of Foxconn Technology Group, Apple's largest supplier in Jeju City, central China, as the COVID-hit iPhone plant resumes its peak season capacity. At least 17 people were killed in clashes with police in southern Peru, the country's human rights office said. The deadliest day so far of protests demanding early elections and the release of jail from President Pedro Castillo. At least 12 people died and roughly 25,000 people in California were ordered to evacuate, including the entire town of Montecito and nearby areas of the Santa Barbara coast due to high floods and mudslide hazards from a recent string of deadly storms. Thailand's long-serving leader Prayut Shang Ocha vowed to continue his work of running the country as part of a new political party, hinting at a bid to remain prime minister after elections this year. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with K-pop's biggest girl group, Blackpink, expanding their world tours to more Asian nations. Stay safe and have a good night.